morning. Now, we, we understand. What's our vision statement? We All right. This morning, I want to talk about a transformed life. A transformed life. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Oh, good neighbor. We got to live a transformed life. Now, you may be seated. You know, from, from the time that, that all of us comes into conscientiousness of our existence, there is always seemingly that never-ending search for something. Some people are trying to make sense out of life. Some are trying to find identity and purpose. And some are trying to find a cure for what is a deep-seated need, a cure for the soul longing. There's a longing hunger for something that is real and lasting. Am I right this morning? People you can see out in the world, they are searching and trying any and everything, trying uh, to satisfy uh, the emptiness that is on the inside of them. And isn't it funny that people want to find solutions to their problems, they want to find healing, they want to find deliverance, and they will seek out remedies and answers and directions. And when they receive it, they refuse to do what has been told them, and they end up in the same predicament that they started. And so realistically, all of us can certainly... Uh, look back and think of incidences that you received some good instruction, but you did not follow it, and now you wish you had. Can I get somebody to say amen right there? Oh, yeah, come on. There's somebody beside me who uh, received some instruction, received an impartation, received a download from somebody about some particular way you were walking or living, and you did not receive it. And all oh, the things that happened as a result that you look back and you wish sometimes, I wish that I had just listened. My God, it's like going to the doctor, getting a prescription and getting it filled and then putting it on the shelf and then continue complaining about being sick. You would say, that's crazy, isn't it? That's crazy that you have gone, you've gotten a diagnosis and you've gotten a prescription and you've gotten it filled and you bring it home and put it on a shelf and go about talking about I'm sick. That's the same as getting a, a word for your situation and then uh, not making application but going about doing the same thing. In the text this morning, we discover that it opens with somewhat of a resume-style description of a man named Naaman. Now, Naaman was a commander of the army of the king of Amram, and he was a great man in the sight of his master. He was highly regarded because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now, now understand that Naaman was a valiant soldier, some kind of mighty man. The Bible says it there, and I believe that the writer goes to great lengths to tell us about all the great things about Naaman because he was trying uh, to make an important point. For in the very next breath, he says, uh, if you will, look at verse number one, and he talks about how honorable he was in the eyes of his master because of him, because of his leadership, because of what God used him to do or what God allowed them to do. Uh, he did great feats, but uh, the next verse says, but he was a leper. Now, here in that statement, we find the reality of the buts of life. In other words, we find the success and the tragedy of life are all summed up in a single word, but. Somebody say, but. You only need a little imagination to fill in the details, and you have a book of human life. 
and you understand life with all its pride and all of its humblings, its grandeur and its shames. And the writer tells us in the same breath of this man's glories and of his awful cross. He says he was a great man, but if only we could get rid of that little word, how happy we would be. Because that word is always popping up to disturb our self-aggrandizing nature and our sense of importance. That word always shows up some kind of way. It speaks, it tells us that no matter who you are, no matter what your accomplishments, no matter what your status, there is always a but associated with your name. Tell your neighbor, you got one too. Uh-huh. It, it, might, it might come because of what somebody says about you because folk will attach uh, one on you on their own. You hear people say, I like her, but. Well, I think she's a pretty good person, but. Well, you know, he's all right. Huh? They will find a way, and my God, they will try to use it, and they'll try to tear you down. Somebody can be speaking nicely about you. Somebody can be uh, acknowledging some gift you have, and then you can look on that person, the other person's face, and they say, yeah, but. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Now, I'm talking to the church now. I'm not talking to folk out. I'm talking about people on the inside of the house. Now, and so sometimes people attach one to you, and then there are times when life itself casts the but word on you. Paul says it was a thorn in the flesh. He said he asked the Lord to remove it, and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Uh, so uh, my advice this morning is don't ever look down on somebody else because you may not be in the same situation as he or she is. Just remember that Every man born of a woman hath but a few days and they're full of trouble. There is some flaw, there is some defect, there is some ever rising sin in all of us because the Bible said we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so you stop looking at my butt and I'll stop looking at yours. Huh? Because the reality is all of us have them. I can't help it. Huh? And, and so the, the Bible says he was a great man, but he had an issue. Huh? She was a great uh, worshiper, but she has an issue. Uh, she, he was a great preacher, but, come on somebody, he's a great missionary, but. He's a pretty good person, but. All right? So the word says that Naaman was a leper. And, and the Bible says that during one of the battles that uh, they had uh, gone in and overtaken some of the people. And, and there was this young slave girl that, uh, that came in to serve Naaman's wife. And, and she uh, noticed, she noticed that, uh, that Naaman had leprosy. Now, now understand that. We are talking about that we are a church that glorifies God, wins souls, and we also transform lives, all right? So now, here is a young girl who had been brought uh, in, and she was an Israelite. She is serving, and she catches what is obvious. She discerns what's going on, and she takes personal opportunity to help uh, bring some transformation into this man's life. Huh? See, we got to be careful how we sit around and see people who are in conditions and circumstances and situations and look away without even having enough interest to turn and get involved. Come on, somebody. Uh, you see it. Uh, you discern it. You've seen what it looks like, and, and, and you've uh, observed it. And if we're really going to be the kind of church that transforms lives, we got to be like this little slave girl who took this position, who took her opportunity to say, you know what? I, I can't just sit here and watch them go through that. I can't just be a church member. And there are people who are coming in who have all kinds of maladies and, and addictions and situations and then just look away like nothing is going on. This woman told, this slave girl told her mistress, Naaman's wife, he said, she said, now listen, I see that situation. And if only my 
my master Naaman could get to the prophet, get to the man of God, he would bring transformation in his life. Oh, my God. Uh -oh. When we say we glorify God, we win souls, that means that we all help transform lives. It's, it's a personal responsibility. It's not just for one committee. It's not just for one ministry. It's not just for the preacher. It's not just for the evangelism team. It's not just for the, the, the pastoral care team. But everybody has to open up your eyes and say, God, show me where I can help be a part of bringing transformation into somebody's life. My God, there's no need in our worshiping and coming and singing about our own blessing, our own breakthrough through our own healing, our own financial miracles, and never open our eyes to see what God needs to do in people that are walking. Somebody on your road needs transformation. There are people who come in the doors who need transformation, but we overlook them. But thank God that, my God, when a church glorifies God and when a church has a heart to win souls, then it's going to come spiritually natural that we got to be a part of helping to bring transformation in our, somebody's life. Is that, do I have anybody? Y'all listening in here? And so, so, so she tells, she tells uh, Naaman's wife, and Naaman's wife says uh, to Naaman, listen, I, I, that my little servant girl there, you know, she's one of those Jews, and she says that there is a man that, uh, it, that can bring some transformation in your life. And so, so Naaman, Naaman then begins envisioning his victory. And see, if you can just speak a word to somebody of hope, somebody that, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily that they need a new dress. It's not necessarily they need an outfit from you. It's not necessarily that they need a dollar from you. But sometimes if you can just give them a word of hope, if you can encourage them to let them know that it's going to be better, I, I, if, if I could just get one word to you, it can turn your life around. So, so Naaman got a vision of the new possibilities. He received the word, and the Bible says that he went to the king, well, his king, and then his king sent a letter to the king of Israel about Naaman. All right? See, see you got to recognize that transformation and helping to bring transformation in the lives of people is a we job. Huh? Huh? See, see notice now, the we, that, there's some we in this, that, that Naaman needs transformation and there's some we going on. The, the slave girl said, I got to take personal responsibility, I got to speak the word. Sometimes you got to be the initiator. Sometimes you got to be the one to make the first call. Sometimes you got to be the one that the Spirit speaks to and says, go over there and check on such and such. Look at that guy. Look at that girl. Uh, that lady with those children. That, that, that new couple that seems to be struggling and trying to get on their feet. That one, you know, you got, he's got a record. You know it's challenging for him. Have you offered any food? Have you offered any kind of opportunity? Have you said anything to him? Or do we just ride away in our sedans? Huh? And ride by and say, mm, ain't that a shame going there? Huh? See, there's a we. There's a we-ness in bringing transformation. A church cannot just wait. You got, look at your neighbor's statement, you got to take personal responsibility. God's holding you. When he puts it in your spirit, you got to do something with it. My God. And listen, sometimes when you bring in transformation, you can't wait to get it back to the prayer team. Huh? God wants you to start. You jump it off. Uh, don't wait. Let me just as soon, baby. Just as soon you hold on right there. Just as soon as I, I can't get nobody on the line. Just as soon as I can get somebody on, I can't call get a, Elder Abe. Just as soon I can't get Bishop. I can't get the off. God said, "Cause uh, you are there, and when you are there, all of us are there. You get it jumping. Tell your neighbor you get it jumping." Huh? You got a word. You might have to release a prayer yourself. You might have to give an encouraging word yourself. You might have to try to muster up a little gas money yourself for that person. Sit your. I can't get anybody. And, and then, and then the king got involved, and he said, "I'm gonna send a letter to the king where the prophet is." Huh? There's some more weakness there. Huh? 
Sometimes you got to be an a, a intercessor. Sometimes you got to be a go-between. Sometimes a good letter of referral. Sometimes being a good witness for somebody. Sometimes putting in a good word for them helps them now in the process of their transformation. Do I have anybody? Huh? So the king sent a letter, said, okay, I want to be a part of your transformation. And, and he sent a, a, a letter to the king of, in, in the land of Israel. The king of the land of Israel, when you read down through there, he didn't know what in the world to think. And he, he tore his clothes. And that uh, was a time of mourning when he tore his clothes. It just means that he was sitting and mourning. And, and he was like, my God, is something getting ready to happen that these people are getting ready to come after me? And whenever the prophet heard that the king had torn his clothes, the prophet came to find out what was the reason. And he says that I got a letter from the king that said there's a man that has leprosy by the name of Naaman. All right? So, so Naaman, the Bible says when you, when you read down through there, uh, Naaman uh, went and he got in verse number four, he got the letter, the king sent the letter, and uh, Naaman, the Bible says in verse number five, departed. And he took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and then change, 10 changes of clothing, all right? He got his little entourage together, pulled some money out of the treasury, <laughs> huh? got his best uh, and finest designer clothes together, and uh, he put together the best looking horses and the finest chariot, and he was heading in the direction of the prophet. He was in search for meaning, he was in search for significance, he was in search of healing, he was in search of deliverance, and you must know that the opportunities of a lifetime must be seized during the lifetime of opportunities. Huh? You got to understand, you got you to gotta step in. There's some times that, listen, you got to strike it while it's hot. Huh? I know we got to pray about some things and contemplate some things, but there are some things you got to hit it while the opportunity is there. You got to seize the opportunity. Huh? I mean, my God, because there's some times that you can almost wait too late and, the, and, and you can just get your foot right in there before the door already closes. And so he had to seize this opportunity, and he's now on his way uh, to see the prophet. And uh, you got to recognize that Naaman now, look at, um, oh, let's see, verse number 9. Let's look at verse number 9. Because Elijah said, well, tell the king, let him come to me. All right? Send him to me. All right? And so Elijah says, I want to be a part of his transformation. See, we transform lives. Isn't that what we said? How, you, how are we going to transform lives if we don't want to get involved and deal with people? Huh? And listen, you can't, you can't wait on somebody's little pretty little situation. I'll deal with some of that. We'll deal with this, but we're not dealing with that now. If they come here and they got that issue, no, the church, we don't have nothing for them. We want to pick and choose. Naaman had leprosy. Let's let leprosy be the metaphor for everything that ails people. Huh? Come on. Liars, gossipers, huh? Are, are people addicted? Uh, come on. Homosexuals, lesbians, come on now. Huh? Uh, uh, abusers, wife beaters, come on. Huh? All of it. All right? If we have people who transform lives, then don't tell me who not to send to the church. Elijah said, I don't care what he has. Now understand, we want everybody who, is, who has anything to come, all right? And, and uh, he said, send him to me. Now, that doesn't mean you condone everybody's thing that comes. They come, and your, your agenda is not judgment. Your agenda is transformation. I can't get two or three in here. Nobody, nobody asks you to put your hand on your hip and say, child. No, you, know how, you know how to say, child, did you, honey, honey, did you, did you see that? Huh? No, nobody asked. Huh? 
Elijah said, send him to me. I want to be a part of his transformation. Because, listen, uh, Elisha said, because I'm a part of transforming lives. My God. Uh, transformation is changing uh, one form to another form. Huh? It comes from that whole idea of metamorphosis. All right? The changing of a caterpillar, you know, into a butterfly. Metamorphosis. All right? And so he said, send him to me. And so now Naaman is on his way. And I tell you that uh, whatever you are in search of, deliverance, health, forgiveness, salvation, love, grace, mercy, wealth, prosperity, the first thing you got to do is go to the right source. My God. Come on now. How many times we go everywhere else? We run to everything else except the right source. All right? Source is essential, and we got to be, we got to know that as, as people, we got to understand that where you turn for an answer has a lot to do with your victory and your success, or the lack thereof, huh? So Naaman, Naaman, he didn't run down to the palm reader, he didn't run down to the soothsayer, he didn't run down to mother nobody, he went to the man of God he didn't turn to dope. Come on, somebody. He didn't turn to sex. Come on. He didn't turn to pornography. Come on now. He didn't turn to gambling. But he said, all right, I'm going to God. I'm going to the source. They said he's able. And uh, so, so he had faith enough in believing what the little slave girl said about what God could do through the prophet. Now, let me tell you something. I don't care your position in life. This little slave girl must have had some weight to her. She had to be carrying some heavy glory around that house for a slave girl to speak to the mighty warrior. And the mighty warrior saw enough God in her to say, I believe there's something to There ought to be somebody that can watch your life, watch your walk, watch your talk, that you have enough weight of glory that when you speak, it ought to make a difference in, I can't get anybody in here. Y'all not going to help me today, all right. Naaman, now, Naaman rides up with his entourage to Elijah, the prophet's house. And the Bible said that the prophet didn't even come out. Huh? Huh? He, he didn't even come out. All right? And uh, the prophet, let's see, what verse am I? Verse number 9. The Naaman went with his horse and chariot and he stood at the door of Elijah's house. And Elijah, verse 10, sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. Now, now wait a minute. Hold on a minute. Um, this man must not know who I am. Huh? Um, I, excuse me. Will, will you let him know I, this is Naaman? I'm a mighty man of valor. I, I have won many battles. I have had favor. I'm a noble man. I'm, I'm a man of uh, regalia. And this thing that... Naaman now got furious at what the prophet did. Huh? See, see, Naaman probably said, I dare you send him out to me with a message. Huh? It insulted Naaman and his own sense of self-appreciation. But one thing is good is that he went to the right source. And there are a whole lot of people who come to the right source, they just don't like what the source gives them as a solution to their situation. There are a whole lot of folk come to church and they get a word, but they don't like the word because the word doesn't suit them. I don't have anybody. Second thing I want to tell you is not only do you have to go to the right source, but the second thing is that God's cure for what ails us puts everybody on the same level. Huh? It doesn't matter if he was a mighty man of valor. You got to understand, aren't you glad, though, that it doesn't matter who you are or how much you have or how much you don't have, that everybody is on the same level in Jesus' blessing business? You see, some people can get better medical care based on money. Some people can get a better trial based on money. 
But when it comes to receiving from Jesus, my God, he's so high you can't go over him. He's so low you can't go under him, but you got to come right in at the door. It doesn't matter your skin color. It doesn't matter your nationality. It doesn't matter your past or your present. You got to be willing to submit to the direction that the prophet gives. Naaman went away mad. Look at verse number 11. Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and wave his hands over the place and heal the leprosy. See, he came with some preconceived idea of how God was going to work it out. And sometimes we come in and what we want God to do is rubber stamp our plan rather than submitting to his plan. My God, my God. Maybe that's why sometimes we're still walking around in brokenness. Maybe that's why we're still walking around addicted because, God, I thought you would at least have done it this way. Maybe you saw God work in somebody else's life one way, but you decided, well, that's the way. I already know, God, how I want you to fix it. I already know, God, how I want you to work it out. See, God, I want you to do it this way. Now, I don't want you to do disturb any of the other stuff I got going on but I want you to heal this situation and we come already with our minds made up as to what he's going to do and how he's going to do it and when he doesn't do it like we want to do it we get mad and ride off from the church and sometimes we say I ain't going back He didn't work it like I thought it. I expected God to do it this way. I expected him to turn it around at this point. I wanted him to bring the child back home that way. I wanted him to fix the marriage this way. I wanted him to open the door that way. And I don't understand why God didn't do it the way I thought it was going to be done. And God said, because I'm God and I know what's best for you. I made you. I created you. Don't you give me a plan. You come and line up with my plan. I can't get anybody in here. So he went away, you know, and so some people think they can't get a healing unless somebody's waving, slapping all, throwing them in the floor, throwing quilts all over you and all that kind of stuff. Some people think it ain't no spirit moving uh, because the prophet didn't come out and do this. Sometimes people sitting there saying, Lord, please let him touch me before I go home. I need my breath. Sometimes you got to recognize you can just be in the atmosphere and the word of God is released and you get a healing right in the praise. You don't have to have anybody to lick your head with all Come on, I believe in the licking of head with oil because that's the Bible, but that's not the only way God can bless. Sometimes, my God, my sister who couldn't have children and they told her she would never have children was up in the stands at a Benny Hinn uh, night of ministry and in the stands got her healing. She got thro three rusky, dusky boys and she got her healing. She never made it to the stage. They never said, Pastor Benny, he, she couldn't have have children and now she got they didn't say that but she went back to Goldsboro and she got pregnant and did it again and again don't wait on what you think ought to happen you say any way you bless me Lord I'll be I don't have anybody in here the prophet said go strip and dip prophet was sitting there working on his message. He said, go tell him to strip and dip in Jordan River. And he didn't even look up. He gave him the word. Huh? All right? See, see that's, that's the problem. It's symptomatic of the determination of humanity to secure its own spiritual healing, even though it continues to fail. Huh? See, my way... It's not his way. My thought is not his thought. His thoughts are higher than mine. Huh? All right? So, 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 uh, you got to understand, you can't develop your own brand. You can't use your own philosophy and ideology and all that stuff. Uh, you got to understand, you got to be accountable to the word of God. Now, listen, uh, you got to be careful when you begin to assess with I. Because this is not a self-made religion. Huh? Uh, it's a religion based on the word of God. Naaman, all he had to do is go dip. Huh? The prophet gave the solution, but it didn't suit him. 
And you'd like to be able to heal yourself, and you try. We, people medicate, anesthetize their problems with man-made solutions. Oh, we try to quiet our inner soul with drugs, with relationships, with alcohol, with rebellion, but they always bring you back uh, to your beginning because they are just temporary cover-ups to a deeper deficiency. Huh? Naaman had turned his back on his whole hope for cleansing and wholeness. And it's sad to report that people come to church and search and you tell them what they need and they turn their back and leave. Naaman said, that Nazi Jordan River was nasty, murky, dirty. Now how you going to talk you got leprosy? The water should have had problem with you getting in it. You got leprosy and you got the nerve to be talking about how dirty that water is. See, we have this preconceived, self-righteous, self-aggrandizing, I'm more than that. The Bible said don't think more highly of yourself than you are. I know you got on a pretty outfit. I know you got a few nice things and all that stuff, but don't get the big head. You got to recognize your humanity is just like anybody else's. All right? Naaman said, I thought, I, 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 I thought that it, maybe I could go and dip in one of the, in the Abana or the Parfar rivers of Damascus, that, that the waters there are better than any of these waters. Couldn't I wash in them and be clean? And he told a chauffeur-driven chair, get out of here, man, let's go. Huh? Come on, come all the way down here. That man telling me something about you want to be born again, you got to be saved, you got to be sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Get, man, let's get out of here. I don't want to hear that. That's, huh? See, see, now, here again, I only have a couple of minutes. We transform lives. It's, it's a unified effort to get a man or a woman transformed. Huh? Because, listen, we had the slave girl who got involved. We had the king who sent a letter to the other king. The other king, by going into mourning, brought the attention of Elijah. Elijah said, bring her to me. And even though the man wanted cleanliness and wholeness and healing and transformation, he rejected it until somebody else got involved. I wish I had somebody. See, sometimes people come to church, they get a word. You, maybe somebody invited them. They came to church. They heard the singing. They heard the word. And then they get mad and they leave. But see, that's where we ought not leave them. Huh? Don't, no, 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 no. See, we got some after work to do. All right, look at verse number 13. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? Huh? If he told you to go and do some big feat or some spectacular thing, you would have done it. See, that was some weak. They were, they were interested in this transformation. See, you can't help. You won't step in right there if it doesn't matter to you. See, if you, if you say your fault and no more, if you don't care if anybody else is on the boat or not. Huh? As long as my family, my children, I want to make sure mine are safe. Long as, but no, if you got a spirit that you understand we transform lives, you might have to catch them in the grocery store. You might have to catch them on the job. You may have to give them a text message. You may have to call them up. You may have to hit them on social network and say, I saw you at church the other day, and I noticed that you left, uh, and maybe you have to explain some things. Maybe you got to help break some things down. Maybe you have to encourage them some more and say, listen, it's the right thing, and you, you, know, you, you can do a whole lot of things, but don't miss what God told you to do for your transformation. Other people, the weakness, somebody say we. All right? We transform lives. And they said, they said, you ought to go on and do what the man says and just wash and be clean. And that right there, good God of mine. See, some folk won't even hear me. 
they get a general message, but it's when you get right beside them and your compassion and your heart and your interest begins to move in them and you begin to convince them that's the right thing to do. And they'll turn that chariot around. And the next opportunity they get, they say, you know what, I'm going to be saved. And I'm going to do, I'm going to line up, I'm going to get into the place of transformation because i got to understand that as the Bible says in Romans 12 and 2, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. They helped him to renew his mind. you got to help people to renew their mind and not fashion themselves as the world. And when they renew their mind, they'll turn their chariot around and get ready to go dip. Naaman said, all right. He said, yes, I'm getting ready to get my transformation. Huh? Huh? He said, so, so verse number 14, so he went down and dipped. Good God Almighty. See, what, see how important you are? Huh? That we, that we. And so the third thing, and I'm done, is you got to humble yourself. You got to humble yourself, all right? And so understand, too, and I don't have time to explain it. My time is gone. But transformation is a process. Transformation is a process. We get regenerated, saved, and then we are sanctified. We are set aside as holy. And the sanctification is a daily walking as unto the Lord. And in the process of daily sanctification, we find transformation. Notice now, he didn't say dip one time. So it tells me there's a process that, that it, 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 it just wasn't a talk. You, you get saved immediately, but your sanctification and your transformation can come over a process. All right, I, I live each day more and more growing in him, becoming stronger each day, surrendering my life to him each day, living as under to Christ each day. And so we got to understand then that he went down and came up, but he still had some issues. Went down again. So don't, don't give up on people too quickly. See, sometimes we think they came down, they got saved, and then now look at them. I saw them going right back over to the liquor house. Huh? And, and, and you got to understand, grace and sanctification is a process. Huh? That he is working it out. And we write them off. Huh? We, we dismiss people. Thank God. That God doesn't dis dismiss the people we dismiss. Because the truth is that somebody dismissed me. I don't have anybody. Somebody dismissed you. Come on, somebody. Somebody said that old gal will never amount to anything. You watch me. Well, I want you to watch me now. Come on, somebody. That old gal, that old boy with his old managed self, he ain't going to ever amount to anything. Look at him. He come from nowhere, and he ain't going nowhere. But you ought to keep your mouth off of people because the very people that you might speak against might be the very people that need to come and lay a hand on you to give you a drink of water. You got to be careful and say, God, keep on working with him. Keep on dealing with him. Keep on, and let me keep encouraging him. Go on and dip again, Naaman. I see you, you out there. And those servants say, go on, take another dip, third time. And he came up, he was still there. And then the fourth time, he came down and came back up. They were like, come on, Naaman, you can do it. They kept encouraging him and pushing him. You got to push people. If we're the kind of church that transforms lives, we got to keep pushing people. We got to keep calling. We got to keep encouraging them. We got to say, you will make it. You will make it. By faith, I believe you're going to kick those drugs. By faith, I believe you're going to quit those habit by faith I believe you're gonna overcome because you are an overcomer you're not the head and not the tail come on you are above and not beneath you got to keep speaking and encourage and praying for somebody prayed for me had me on their mind took a little time and prayed for me and I'm so glad this morning hallelujah my time is up everybody on your feet